I love you. <laughs> okay. So typically I would start off by showing slides chronologically of my work, but tonight I was really excited about showing you images of things I'm working out right now, even though they're pretty half-baked, and to reveal my process a little bit. And the way that these images are coming together are under this heading or theme that I've come up with called Now I Lay Me, which comes from that prayer. Do you guys know the prayer? Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And as a little kid saying this prayer, I used to go to bed really worried that I was going to die and not wake up. And I was like, how do you die in your sleep? And will I experience pain? And, you know, I used to just think that maybe that was the reason why I had this crazy reoccurring dream where I was basically this willing participant coming to meet my maker or my death. And, and the dream was actually, when I look back at it, pretty aestheticized and, and very perverse. So it's this sort of triangulation between sex, death, and youth that somehow this work is coming together. And I know that's really vague. Uh, so I've been trying to think of one word that brings it even tighter, more cohesively together. And, and what keeps popping up lately, thanks to Sheila, is this notion of vulnerability in the sense of um, it meaning maybe exposure or disclosure of oneself. So I want to just touch on a couple of these images. The top left is a drawing with tape, and it's basically specs for a glass coffin I want to make. And to go with it is this contract, which you cannot read at all. But basically, it's, it's the whole body donation to the arts rather than for the sake of the sciences, where I've taken a template and I've changed all the verbiage because I want, in this case, I still want to be an organ donor, but it's, you know, once that recipient receives my organs, I want to be stitched up and placed in this glass coffin and be put on display, decomp and all, for the sake of it being like this <coughs> very gnarly uh, portrayal of the nude or self-portraiture. Um, you know, I've got legalities to work out here. <laughs> but, um, so anyway, the next, next sculpture is a four foot by four foot sculpture. Um, while it looks abstract, it actually is a pretty tight realistic representation taken from a, a, a photograph of my own blastocyst embryo. Blastocyst meaning this is textbook, this is the best thing you could hope for. It's not finished, you know, I want to make this a more sensual, beautiful object in itself and, and finish it, you know, in a perfect world, I'd have it plated in, you know, gold, to have it be the commentary I want around today's fertility. Uh, this is um, very black and white in this picture, but this is um, actually, it has a little coloring to it. This is a fetal skull that I've casted in bone and cremation ash, and I don't have a, a title for this piece yet. Uh, this is a jar of my skin. It's titled Skin Jar, Self-Portraiture, and I've been collecting my skin in a jar since the year 2000. And at the beginning of this year, I decided to take my eyelashes and my skin and cover an impression of my face as a form of the death mask. Um, you know, what's interesting to me here is sort of the relationship with the outer appearance of things and the inner character. So. Uh, in this case, you know, what I can add topographically that would reveal something. In this case, it would be my obsessive compulsive disorder. <laughs> and then taking this idea of physiognomy, uh, and, and, you know, that outer and that inner relationship, and I'm creating this movie right now with like a morphine software and a software that I have to work with my orthodontist. It's really pretty cool, but um, using the impression or the idea of the clown as the mask, the form of a mask, uh, because of my relationship with the clown as a kid, going back to this youth, and, and it wasn't so much one of fear, like, you know, everyone has that fear of clowns, or some people have the fear of clowns, but it was one of distrust, because what I was reading on the face was so incongruent, and so it's that complexity or that contradiction that I'm sort of looking for in the work. And then compiling lots of imagery for this video has almost created this subset of work that I'm titling Fren, P-H-R-E-N. And this is a, a fitting word for, for me. I mean, basically, uh, I'm interested in sort of the, it being the base word for phrenology. I don't know if you guys know that early pseudoscience where they believe that, you know, before the days of forensics, if you measure the skull, you could determine who's criminal. But as an identical twin, um, you know, supposedly I have a higher propensity for being schizophrenic than, than other people. Um, but so this work, you know, all my work is, and I realize this comes on the heels of Cindy Sherman's work, so I, I kind of feel like I need to address that. 
And in her work, I guess how I can di differentiate is that her work is not autobiographical and it's about effacement. My work is autobiographical and so I guess inherently, you know, it's about notions of self-preservation. But I want my work to be emotive and revealing, um, maybe act as a mirror, you know, like allow the viewer to tap in to my psyche and then something's reflected back. Um, so this is, you know, I'll show you toward the end, um, there's more on, on friend, but um, this is a study for a painting I'm doing right now, which is almost complete. I almost want to turn this around, but I guess I won't. Um, so that's, that's like a preview. Now I'm going to backtrack and do the chronological walkthrough of my work so you can see a progression. And I go back this far, this was in 2006, because the show was actually here in Austin, and it continues to be fertile seed for me. This was titled Eugenics, which means the study of, of perfection. So this show was about spectacle. And, you know, the space itself had these pivoting walls, and so immediately when I saw this space, I thought, metaphor for compartmentalized body and the body's experience to the world. And so where we're standing right here in the foyer, what I wanted to create right here, and by the way, on opening night, there was this red carpet mock, uh, paparazzi as you entered the space, which I have pictures of Rachel. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to include it, I didn't have time, but they, you know, no one was allowed to take pictures, but the people that came to the show wanted to participate with the paparazzi, so I actually had pictures of this performance space. But so you walk in after this sensationalism, you're greeted with champagne and these sort of beautiful idyllic portrayals, and then as you progress deeper into this space, this spectacle of anxiety would be revealed. And so the narrator of the show was this continuum of paintings as one piece that I, I titled Individ Slash Duality. And it's because it's dichotomously read from end to end as well as within each individual painting. So as you're walking in from right to left, you might read, you know, public, private, fantasy, reality, otherness, oneness, object, subject, etc. Um, and individually, you could also read that duality or ambiguity. For instance, if, if you looked at like the red painting, you might first, and I'm sorry these images are so small, but you might first read, okay, two naked chicks on red satin, you know, red satin being this cliche of desire. Uh, here I'm riffing on, you know, how the media has taken the, this notion of twins and turned them into an icon and over-sexualized them for the sake of selling product. But on the other hand, I wanted to reveal something really honest about these two individuals that deeply cared about each other as one's protecting the other. And so there's other strategies in this lineup of work. Uh, for instance, the, the twins of paintings or the twins of twins, the, the green and the pink, where I'm exploring platonic notions of, of reproduction, uh, where, you know, it's like, like the media, I'm taking images of woman and I'm pushing her further and further from reality. And then the black and white, I'm inverting it for the sake of, you know, giving it a medical read which deepens the narrative or is an attempt to desex the nude. So in the very back of the exhibit, sort of in the bowels of this metaphor bar, bar, body, um, I'm trying to have the depictions of women be actually more realistic, you know, even excruciating. And so in the two movie stills are variations of self-mutilation, and then on the far right, these maggots that are mar migrating their way toward the viewer symbolizes um, you know, our, our mortality. And then as you finally walk back to the front of the exhibit, the spectacle is revealed. You get that when you first experienced these as being really beautiful, now they're incredibly grotesque and dehumanizing as you know, the, the subjects are, the, the people are negated their identity, a competition between women, identical products selling seemingly starvation, and this replication and uh, fragmentation of women. So after this dystopian show, um, after this dystopian show, I was thinking, oh my God, you know, what do I, you know, what do I possibly do now, and how do I portray myself and others, and, you know, what's really going on with me, you know, what's true for me, and, and how do I put that in the context of art history. And I knew that I did want more depictions of self-mutilation and alienation and dissociation, even, you know, revolt. I wanted to create this really ephemeral fantasy place, this sort of garden, a garden of Eden where women could come together 
and they could, um, you know, sort of explore self-permission and self-pleasure and frivolity and dress up like that girl and make fun of herself at the same time. So this show was in Houston two years later, 2008, in, in Houston, Texas, and it was titled Fête Bucalique, which is French for Feast of the Rustic Rural Pastoral Life. So these were contemporary pastorals. I was parodying Renaissance pastorals, so by the likes of like Giorgione pastoral concert where the noblemen come to the countryside and they're like layered in their clothing, ornate clothing that reek of their status and they're playing instruments while the women are in the nude pouring pitchers of water. And so these, these women are actually parading and they're dressed because they actually appreciate and like being looked at these sort of uh, pageants, pageant orphans of the wild. And these seemingly vacuous replicas, while they look very similar, the dissimilar pussies on their lap show that they're very individualistic. And so in this work, I'm using strategy to sort of banter with these historic, patriarchal, dominant structures of looking. And so one of these strategies is the performative element where there's the obvious wigs and makeup and the sexual uh, childlike codes of dress and even the tapestry like backdrops that signifies this is a stage. Um, one is, one strategy is also, you know, I'm sorry about these images, you can't really see the detail, but in this bottom picture which is titled Surrender, I've got embedded, for instance, a, a lot of like these contradictions of desire, these personal narratives that are really revealing and although they're not accessible for you to understand, they're pretty coded, but they're, they're a visual diary and so that's one layer or strategy. And then there's this strategy of beauty where I'm gluing all of this uh, Swarovski crystals and, and artifice to the canvas and all the language that that denotes is really intentional, whether it be this is a face mint or feminine craft or the decorative, I'm just going, going for it, like that's all intentional. And then also taking these um, these uh, symbolic animals and bringing them in, into a three-dimensional form and making these um, objects of desire trophies like the bottom right, which is, this is usually very pink. It's a, a very pink pussy. It's pink-mounted pussy. And so that led to, you know, a tangent of me making these beautiful pussies. So like all my work, I wanted there to be double entry points into the work, at, at least a double narrative. Um, in the context of Fet Wukali, these were devotional, they were a stand for feminine power, a woman's right to love and adorn her body. But on the other hand, I wanted these to be satirical, their social commentary, where I'm basically saying, you know, it's absurd that media is taking sexuality and linking it to ideas of class and privilege and beauty. And so anyway, then I'm taking the, the same theme of self-pleasure and bringing it into my next show in Chelsea, New York, titled Hidomi um, in 2010. And I'm so sorry, these, you can't really see what's going on in these paintings, it's, it's embarrassing. But th this painting is um, covered in artifice. It's like, trust me, it's beautiful. It's got rhinestones all over. This is titled Hidomi, the Goddess of Pleasure. and. So here, she is controlled by no gaze. She is an active subject in pursuit of her own power, and her gaze is placed on this um, androgynous, big, beautiful cock. And so what emerged from this work is then my making this very crafty, androgynous, big, beautiful cock, which stands 10 feet tall and is being pursued or taken down by this beautiful pussy. And so what I'm realizing now with this work is that it's more than devotional and it's more than about body commodity. This work is sort of em emblematic of our Western societal sexual vernacular. In other words, you know, this is what I'm sensing, how we demonstrate as a society and discuss sex, love, and intimacy is through this euphemism and pun and kitsch. And so what I've created here is this quasi-porn centerfold of this beautiful cock and pussy, as you can see by the page on the wall and on the floor. And the centerfold is for a book that now I'm interested in doing that is titled Pillow Book as Inheritance. And the pillow book that I'm inspired by is a Shunga pillow book. And Shunga in Japanese actually literally means images of spring, which is a euphemism for sex. 
And the pillow book, as there's different variations that I'm interested in, is the very small accordion style book that's tucked into the sleeve of a young bride or geisha. And on her wedding night, she pulls it out, and it's sort of this manual for lovers or this book of advice. And it's, you know, the, the man and woman disrobe, and you read it from right to left, and, and their genitalia is like grossly enlarged, and it's highly pornographic, and it's passed down from the mother to the daughter. So I'm like, whoa, you know, like, my mom never gave me anything. <laughs> like you know, how is it that we're informed by, you know, by our society, by our, our parents? How are we informed um, sexually? And so this is sort of a, you know, like my utopian thinking here is, is sort of a critical tool. It's kind of cynical. Um, but I'm thinking about, you know, one of the ways that I learned about sex was by finding those poorly hidden porn mags under my uncle's bed and like going through it and just being astonished by that level of exposure and, and me sort of grappling with like, whoa, is she, is she confident? Is, it, is this power? Is this good? Is this bad? You know, really trying to figure out what it meant. There was no turn on factor. It was just all cerebral and trying to grapple with moralistically what, what I was, you know, dealing with. And so in this book, I didn't want it to kind of hit you upside the head with something moralistic. I didn't want you to get some sort of agenda, but I did want you to grapple with it. And so this book was intended to be very precarious. And it's also precarious in that it's dangerous and nobody's going to get what I'm doing here. But So basically, um, you know, it's precarious in the sense that I'm doing porn traits, playing on that idea of pun again and taking my self-portrait faces and, put it on, and putting them on porn bodies and these subjects sort of moving in and out of a perceived power. Um, and then each page is advice that moves in and out of sincerity and cynicism. Um, and then the materials, um, you know, as they're sort of teetering on nails punched through these paintings, these paper paintings, uh, they're just teetering and very precarious and there's other things that make it precarious. But so, anyway, um, so the advice given here are the titles of these pages. I'll, I'll walk through them, and you can't really tell the detail in this, but the, there's these predator plants in each of the paintings, and so they act as the lure that sucks you in and destroys you. So symbolically, um, there's something going on there, and the predator cat in the first one is titled Field Play, as my mom used to always tell me, play the field. You know, what does that mean? You know, play the field. And she, she told me to be promiscuous or just like not get knocked up too early. You know? So then the next one is Daughters of Intemperance with these cyan pussies. Uh, the next one is Look of Love. And it's, you know, I can't tell if you can see the text. It's the big throbber was here. And then the, um, the next one is um, Second Nature, and the crystals are just glued onto the canvas. So it's like they love each other, but they're cat, their pussies are fighting. And then Gestalt, where I've got these block, wood block, you know, craft letters Velcro to the surface that read, my hold is greater by the sum of your parts. And then uh, be fruitful and multiply, which is kind of like what we're taught to do. And then, you know, the further examination of these relations of power now, coming back to the work I'm doing right now, you see the progression, uh, under the heading of Now I Lay Me or Friend. Um, these are studies for paintings I want to do, and um, so the titles of these very quickly is Happy Spanker, Happy Horsey, Sad Fucker, Happy Fucker, and Sad Clown Car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 